Showtime. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Jesus, have mercy upon me, a sinner. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let's see. Ah, oh, I had some kind of material tonight. The title of tonight's lecture is Hierarchy. And it's never too soon to learn some Greek, is it? <laughs> See, priest rule, yeah, means priest. There's reasons why we don't actually use the Greek word for priest, which we'll get to tonight, because I know you're all waiting with bated breath to find out why that would be so. Just to have some fun. Just have had like the rule of the saints, or the rule of the holy. Well, I'm just making up a word now just for fun. Hagiarchy, rule of the saints. I love Greek. You can do stuff in Greek you can't do with Latin. Anyway, so we're going to talk about hierarchy tonight. Um, I thought I'd start at the beginning. Of course, we can start in Genesis at, at tonight because, in fact, Genesis is shot through with hierarchy. And y'all already remember that uh, when we did the little um, the rising tide, the rising line of, of creation is that all the... All the goobery stuff down at the bottom was like the rocks and the planets and the stuff that's not alive and then you got to the plants and then you got to the birds and the fish and then you got to the cows and then you got boom to the people and there they were at the top they are at the top the happy people <laughs> okay there they are trust me they're happy um, because they haven't sinned yet of course they're happy now of course at the top they're really at the top is God all right and then if we take that rising line and flip it over, then we get a mountain. And remember, a mountain, by its very nature, is hierarchical. Now, part of the point is, and remember the things down here, it's like, oh, you know, I don't know how many, how many things, how many, how many suns are there are in the, in, the, in the universe? We just say uh, 10 to the bazillion to the bazillion. There's a whole lot of, of inanimate stuff in that makes the bottom. And then the higher you go, the fewer there are of things. You know, this, you get up here, and there's, I mean, there's, there's more birds than there are cattle. There's more cattle than there are people, that kind of thing. So by the time you get to the top, it's, it's a natural thing is that the unsophisticated stuff, there's a, a lot of it down at the bottom, and the higher you go, the more, the more elevated in, in their existential character things become. And of course, that ultimately points to God who sets the standard for all that. But it's worth noting that, that hierarchies are part of nature. God made creation hierarchical. Um, let's see if there's any... Anything else you need to say about that? Oh, yeah, and of course, after there was sin, and remember, the ground was cursed after sin. Ooh, like, ooh, look, here's somebody dies. Look, a dead skull. Who wants, who wants to be down there part of, the, part of the cursed ground? Nobody. So everybody's always striving to get up. And remember, if you live in the plains, you build yourself a ziggurat so you can get closer to God. Or if you live like where I had my honeymoon uh, in Yucatan, you build yourself one of, the, one of those castillos. Um, just as an aside, I couldn't believe it. I guess y'all seen this thing. Um, once you get up there, it seemed a lot taller than it really was. It's like the Castillo was like this, and they got the stairs that do this. I don't know if you can go up the stairs anymore. They got stairs on the side. Um, is that that Yucatan is like this flat as a board, and the trees might be 30 feet tall. You don't really even get any tall trees. So it's like I was imagining when I was walking around and Cheech and Eats are thinking, boy, you really don't get a lot of a lot of vista here. I mean, everywhere you look, there's trees, and they're this high, and you can't see anywhere. Um, and we got up to the top of the Castillo, it's like, man, you're like the next step up to heaven. It's like you can see as far as you ever wanted to see. I mean, it's just unbelievable just that one day in Yucatan and to get up there and I mean, it, was like, it was like being God. It's like, ooh, impressive. I was always imagined if you're up, if they carry, you know, they take you up there and they would set, cut your heart out, that somebody had spent their whole lives trundling around on the ground and you took them up there. And I mean, they would like be stunned. Wouldn't, wouldn't have no, no measure of understanding. They didn't have a hack to cut the heart out. But I guess it would be easy to, to, to deal with them because they were like stunned by their circumstances. Anyway, so that's another hierarchy. It's in the nature of things to be hierarchical. Uh, let's see. Now, I have to cut ahead to Exodus. And you all remember that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and they went over the Red Sea. And then, in the third month after their departure, from Egypt, the Israelites came to Sinai, where they pitched camp. And God was in a real good mood, and they were in a good mood because they hadn't done anything to aggravate him yet. 
And Jesus, God said, if you hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my special possessions, dearer to me than all other people, although all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And um, you have probably heard people, especially in Southern Carolina, talk about that, that we are a royal priesthood, and therefore people will conclude that I don't need no damn priest, I don't need no bishop, I don't need nothing, it's me and Jesus. Okay? Now, the reason I bring that up is, is we're going to see exactly how the kingdom of priests works. It's also kind of fun, um, is that in Hebrew, I'm going to use Roman letters, of course. Uh, Mamlaka priest. Cohen. Y'all know the word. Y'all know the last name Cohen. It just means priest. Mamlaka Cohen. A kingdom of priests. And, and the way it works in, um, in Greek is a little bit different. It's funny. Basileon. Basileon. Um, priests. Uh, this. Iera. Y'all already know Iera. Meaning priests. There you go. Yeratoima. The Yeratoima means uh, 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 the, the ruling or the order. And, and the ordering of priest Basileon means, means like the king, like St. Basil, like the Basileos, all that kind of thing, a basilica, thus and so. Kind of peculiar is that, actually, this means kingdom of priests, but this means something else. It means royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. It's a little bit different. And, and later on, we're going to get to this where St. Peter says, which is what people quote a lot, is yes, you are a royal priesthood, which is a way of saying that when that was written for when St. Peter's letter, he was, that was being drawn from the Septuagint. It wasn't being drawn from the Hebrew. Anyway, so now we're going to see how that kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood works out. It says this. The Lord said, I'm coming to see you, coming to, coming to you, coming to visit you in a cloud, which we're painfully familiar with by now. And the people will hear me speaking with you and thus and so. He says, go to the people and have them sanctify themselves today and tomorrow. Make them ready to wash their garments. And remember, they haven't done anything to aggravate God yet. And God has said, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. And now we're going to find out how that kingdom of priests works. Okay, let's see. I have to erase already. Remember all the stuff that's already been drawn, and if you forget it, remember you can refer ad nauseum to this on YouTube starting tomorrow. All right. There. That's Mount Sinai, trust me. Uh, so here's what happens. The Lord will come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. I love this. Remember, royal priesthood, kingdom of priests. Set limits for the people all around the mountain and tell them, take care not to go up to the mountain, up on the mountain, or even to touch its base. If anyone touches the mountain, he must be put to death. So remember, right here, here's your kingdom of priests right here. Don't you dare touch that mountain, or we'll have to kill you. We already can tell that, that if you're limited to the bottom of the mountain and you can't get up on the mountain, you can't even touch the mountain, and somewhere between here and God, there's going to be a hierarchy. Because you're not permitted to go up. So here's what happens. Let's see. The people came out of the camp, and they stationed themselves at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all wrapped in smoke, for the Lord came down, th came down upon it in fire. Ooh. Then the Lord told Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through toward the Lord, or they will be struck down. And the priests, too, who approach the Lord must sanctify themselves, or he will vent his anger upon them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot go up to Mount Sinai because you warned us to set limits around it and make it sacred. And then the Lord said, so Moses is up here somewhere. And all the people are down here, the royal priesthood. And then he says this, God does. Come up again with Aaron, but the priests and the people must not break through or else he will vent his anger upon them. So Aaron gets to come up, but nobody <laughs> else does. And then they have a nice news with God. Then a couple of uh, chapters later, we have another uh, adventure on Mount Sinai. It's very, very similar. Moses was told, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, with 70 of the elders of Israel. So now there's this little <coughs> layer of, of hierarchy in here. You shall all worship at some distance, but Moses alone is to come to the Lord. The others shall not come too near, and the people shall not come up at all. So, we have, like, elders here. 
And then the royal priesthood is still scrabbling around at the bottom. They can't touch nothing or they'll get fried. And then Moses gets to come to the top. Moses is up here. And remember, God is up here because he's at the top of the hierarchy. And it says, Moses then went up with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders, and they beheld the God of Israel. But then God said to Moses, you come up to me. He comes up as a separate thing. It says, Moses, after Moses went up beyond where these nubs, you had the elders, then he had a little smaller group, and then Moses got to go up into God, where, of course, he schmoozed in bliss in the shade of the Shekinah cloud. So, Remember, these are people who have done nothing to aggravate God. He has told them, you are a royal priesthood. But what that means is you get to participate, but you really don't get to, you don't really get to be part of the, part of the club. I mean, it's not like they're not, you're not chased away. You have to participate. God's saying, now that you are a royal priesthood, you do have to participate, but your participation has limits. And there are these other people who are going to be above you who are going to mediate between me and you. Now, And we know it might have been not much longer before. <laughs> I think it was when he was after he was having this uh, long, long time shoes with God that, that years ago I said, we're kind of bored. We, we, we need to worship something. And, and of course, they made the golden calf, and God was a little bit upset with that. Um, and, and so the deal was, I always think it's kind of instructive is that the, the Israelites picked up some interesting habits in Egypt, and one of them was a bad habit, is that they, they worship false gods. And the poor people, I, I think they were just so much in the habit of living in Egypt where every god had some animal form, had a physical form. And then Moses comes and says, the real god is going to get you out of this jam. They say, oh, what is he, what, what's his name? Well, he kind of really doesn't have a name. Oh. Um, well, uh, what does he look like? Well, he doesn't really look like anything. He doesn't have a body. And so I can imagine him out in the desert kind of at loose ends going, well, you know, he must have some kind of body. If he doesn't have one, we'll make up a body for him. So they make up a golden calf, and of course, God is upset. I think that's one of the reasons why there's, there, there was that. The thing about saying you can't make any images of these things. You can't make an image of God the Father because he doesn't have a body. It's not the same as making an image of Jesus Christ who ran around with a body for 33 years and, and still has his body, by the way. Um, I guess that was a, an abrupt digression. Anyway, so what happens is that, is that God is very aggravated. Now remember, at this point, remind me from the Passover, who was doing all the sacrificing? Who did all the sacrifices on, on Passover evening? Was it priests? You have to take your lamb to the priest? No. no. Who did it? Who sacrificed for each family? The elders. The elders. Yes, the elder. There was nothing. God says, I accept your sacrifice. Yeah, the elders can offer these things to me. Just like Abraham made, the, made his own offering. Right Now, though, new deal. God says, you morons, you can't be trusted. It's just like I remember, the same kind of thing like around my house. Is that if a toilet needs fixing, I'm going to fix it. I'm not get anybody pays my hundred dollars to come put a new valve on or something. And you know, it all I always fix things correctly. It's never a problem. But you can imagine if there were a single time that I had to fix the toilet right and water started spraying all over the place, from then on, what would my wife tell me every time the toilet was a problem? Yeah, I want a plumber. Yeah, I want a pro now. You kind of blew your shot. Okay? Same same thing here. It's like, okay, y'all can't be trusted to do the right thing. So we're gonna have the the, the Levites are gonna be in charge. So you know, you get a little bit of a development of this where now you have this permanent Levitical group instead of the elders. Now the elders are all just, you know, scrabbling around here with all the, with all the vermin that compose the, the royal priesthood. Um, and so we get that same arrangement with the meeting tent, which is also hierarchical. There's the meeting tent. And remember, all the kingdom... <laughs> I'm going to draw the big picture because there's actually a, an, an outer court around here. It's, it's like, it's all curtain. And there, there are tent poles on it, which, there, that's enough to make the point, right? Sure. Okay, so the, the average, and all around here is all the Jewish community. This is interesting. First of all, is if you're not part of the club, you don't get anywhere near this. I mean, they've got all the 12 tribes all right around here. If you're not a Jewish person, you have to stay outside the camp, and they will come out to you. So that's already a layer of separation for people that aren't, that aren't part of the royal priesthood. Royal priesthood, you can live around here. Royal priesthood, you can come in here about as far as, as, far as it takes to get to the altar. That's it for you. Then the Levites can run around in here to their heart's content. And then the high priest, and we'll just put a big A for Aaron. Only Aaron can go in here because there's the divine presence which connects up to heaven. So once again, we have the same, the same hierarchy. Everybody can come in down here. You're not so important. Fewer people can come here. They're more important. Only one person. It's always one. It's never like three or four. One, one. One person gets to have that particular high
high, unique relationship with God, who's up in heaven and generally not available. Um, so the, the meeting tent worked like this. Let's see what else you might have had. Oh, and of course the temple worked the same way, except the temple had a little addition. It had the court of the Gentiles. Because, you know, the camp wasn't all around anymore. I mean, people could come to Jerusalem to their heart's content. So they had some kind of an outer court. And I forget, you know, I just keep it like this because it's schematic and functions about the same. But imagine there's some other court out here, which is the court of the Gentiles, which just widened the base of, of, of the hierarchy. Saying, okay, you Gentiles, you, you're good-hearted people. God doesn't hate your guts. You can come in. You can come in that far, but that's as much as he loves you. So, and all the rest of us, we get, we get access. So the, the hierarchy developed a little bit over time, but it still remained the hierarchy. This is something else that's kind of useful to look at here. The way these things work is, especially if I've got the plan like this where you've got the bottom and that's the top, is that what people do, and this is typical for any kind of religious, for a Catholic hierarchy, any Christian hierarchy, is, is offerings start down here at the bottom, and they trickle their way up, and they, and they go all the way, but eventually the offering gets up to God, and then some kind of goodies come down. That's like the process of hierarchy. Um, offerings go up, goodies come down. Uh, usually it's you kill something. And you spill the blood, and a life offering goes up, and some kind of blessings come down. But you know, sometimes it's like bread. It's not, not, not spiritual at all. Um, so that's Exodus. And that was my third one. Now this gets a little bit peculiar because I have to film a little bit. Okay, there's the southern. We've we done this before, too. Um, is the miracle of loaves and fish. You're going to draw another, another hierarchy. Think if you were in the class, you saw this one. But you're going to see it again. Okay. Loaves and fishes. Let's see, up here is Jesus. And Jesus is his own high priest. So there's, there's not another human being up there with Jesus. Then right here we got 12 apostles who, who may not be aware of it at the time of the loaves and fishes, but they are already occupying that space that the Levitical priesthood and the elders did. And then down here are all the people who are hungry, the holy... The, the, the holy priesthood, the royal priesthood, they're all down there, we're hungry, we're royal priesthood, feed us. Okay, so it works the same way. The offering goes up through the intermediary, up to Jesus, and of course Jesus gives thanks to his father in his role as high priest. And then the goodies come back down here, and then the goodies come back down and are distributed to all the people. And remember, this is not just a model for it's a model for the Mass, of course. It works the same way we bring up the bread and wine. It's, we are intercepted at, at the altar, and then the priest takes that and coordinates with Jesus so that the miracle is worked, and then we get to eat the body and blood. Same thing. And this is also the same way the Catholic Church works. Its day-to-day day -day functions as an institution. Is at the bottom. There's the royal priesthood, like me and like you. And then there are these either some intermediates um, that we're going to get to tonight. There's one, there's one. Uh, Jesus is now up in heaven, so there's another person that takes his place there. Um, my goodness, let's about beat that to death. All right, so that's the next, <laughs> that's the next miracle, which we can spend a lot of time on, but remember we spent time on it earlier this year. Um, that, was, that was my fourth one. Here's the fifth one. All right, now, Another thing is that so far at this point, we haven't really gotten anything explicit from Jesus about hierarchy. All you know is that Jesus, Jesus came. He remember, he says, I didn't come to replace. I didn't come to cancel. I came to fulfill. And so, you know, Jesus never, never told anybody, you don't need this system. You don't need the high priest. You don't need, you know, you don't need Pharisees to keep a little bit of tabs on you. No, he never did those things. I mean, up until the, the night he was dying, he was still observing all the, all the rituals of this of this hierarchical system. Um, so when things began to happen, like Jesus, in, in this case, having his intermediaries mediate everything between him and the people, there's more of that going to happen, and they're not always, the apostles don't even quite understand yet what, what the deal is, but we're going to get to how that coalesces presently. Um, this is, I'm not sure if I can keep, keep a, my finger on a piece marked anywhere. I can't. Mm. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. That's the wrong one. Isn't it? Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. And y'all are familiar with this. This is um, Matthew 16 where, where Jesus says, Jesus went to the reason, region of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Um, and they said, well, some say John the Baptist because, of course, he kind of took over John the Baptist's gig. And John the Baptist kind of said, oh, you know, 
you're, this is the 